<coughs> yeah, some of you who might have been uh, at Osmo DEFCON last year uh, might already know uh, about Osmo FL2K. I, I finally found some time to actually uh, clean up the code and fix some remaining bugs and uh, it's already committed but the, pri the repository is not yet set to public but uh, it is now okay yeah great and um, yeah so f for some of you who might not uh, yet know what we're talking about um, those are basically USB 3 to VGA adapters which look like this um, and the I'm going to talk about it in a minute, why the ones with the FL2000 chip from a company <coughs> called Fresco Logic are quite interesting. And um, they come in quite different shapes and sizes. Here are two of them. Um, this uh, black one, for example, here in this case, uh, can be found on eBay, Amazon, AliExpress, uh, and, and sites like that for around five to ten dollars. Um, then there are those smaller ones um, in, in you know, some dongle size and um, they are a bit more expensive but are also like $15. $15. Um, the main idea behind this is basically transmitting RF signals with VGA and uh, using the harmonics of the VGA deck yeah, to transmit those signals. This uh, idea actually has a very long history I think the first um, publicly documented, oh, publicly documented on the internet um, approach was by a guy called Eric Thiele, um, which published Tempest for Elisa. Uh, he was transmitting AM radio with a, uh, he had the CRT monitor still attached, so probably also the monitor was transmitting mainly. Um, which was just, I think, an X, win X window application which um, outputted black and white patterns so that you actually had AM radio at a couple of uh, megahertz. And um, then in 2005, uh, Fabrice Bellard took the approach even further. Uh, he attached a piece of wire to a, a I think, ATI Radian uh, graf graphics card and transmitted um, DVB-T and analog DV. Uh, he wrote his own OFDM modulator um, that, modula uh, that encodes an MPEG transport stream into DVB-T and then transmitted it by changing the X server configuration to basically just output one long line. And um, yeah. And then uh, there are a couple of others. Uh, there's a project called VGA-SIG by a guy called Bartek Kania. Uh, he was transmitting wideband FM, stereo even. Um, and some guys at a German hackerspace called Das Labor, um, they even built a PCB with an IQ modulator and baseband filters and did some experimentation with uh, how to speed up upsampling and software and so on. And uh, yeah, they also had some, some success with that. And I mean, a similar idea, which is quite popular these days, is uh, RPI TX, which uh, basically uses a pin of the of the Raspberry Pi um, to do high-speed PWM where the frequency is modulated and they put the um, data via DMA in there and he, there's all kinds of software even for, for yeah, transmitting uh, FM with RDS or using the harmonics to transmit in the 400 megahertz band so yeah um, but when, when trying to use VGA, there's uh, one major problem. Yeah? You have the H-Sync and V-Sync um, gaps, basically. This, is, this is stems from the old days where you used CRT monitors. Um, so the, the, the cathode ray needed some time to get back uh, for each line and uh, go back with the horizontal synchronization, uh, vertical synchronization to go back to the top left. So there are, there's basically this... Uh, front porch, back porch, and uh, the V-Sync pulse, and there basically all the graphics cards just blank the, the actual data. There's nothing outputted on the, uh, on the actual col color decks. So, yeah, using that, this for SDR basically means, well, this, those are lost samples and this is not user controllable. Uh, and this is very bad for, especially for analog modulation types. 
OFDM can sort of cope with it, like like Fabrice Bellar presented with his uh, DVBT, um, because yeah, you integrate over the symbol duration, and this, so you, it doesn't uh, really affect it that much. But yeah, and um, th which brings us to USB VGA adapters. Well, there are two um, main manufacturers um, that I'm aware of, which. Uh, one is DisplayLink. Um, they all already built ones for USB 2 like a couple of years ago. They are, are quite popular. And uh, yeah, the design is basically a classic classical graphics card with USB interface. So you have a frame buffer, RAM deck, um, and then the frame buffer is just filled with the USB interface. And if the USB connection has some issues, then well, it's there's still, the picture might hang, but uh, there's still something outputted. Um, but uh, a company called Fresco Logic um, took a different approach. They even uh, patented it. And this is more or the less software defined VGA. Um, the frame buffer is residing in host memory, so in the, in the DDR memory of the host. And um, the image is just constantly being streamed via USB 3.0. Which also means you, yeah, you need USB 3.0 because uh, th they have a fallback mode with USB 2.0 where they use some RLE compression and um, the resolution is then limited to 800 by 600. So yeah, and for everything higher you need USB 3. And if you happen to have a bad USB 3 host controller, um, which really makes a difference that it's some some benchmarks on that, then it might be that your Screen is flickering and uh, or doesn't work at all. So, yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't really actually use it for VGA, but um <laughs> uh, but this approach makes the adapters very cheap um, because you have no external RAM. You have this basically si single chip solution. So this sounds very interesting for yeah for, for, for further investigation, and that's uh, why I did yeah look closer at it. So this is a picture of one of those adapters taken apart. So the actual hardware, there's, as you can see, uh, the main chip is this uh, Fresco Logic FL2000 DX chip. Um, it actually comes in two different versions. Uh, this is uh, called 1L0, um, which has a smaller uh, TQFN package and just the VGA output pins. But there's also one which exposes basically 24-bit um, uh, RGB interface where you can attach a an HDMI interface chip. So there are even um, adapters which have this larger chip and then have VGA output, DVI output, and uh, HDMI output. So, and they even do stuff like output uh, also audio, then they use, uh, because here in the middle you see this is the classic um, USB 2.0 connection, uh, or, or one of those, I don't know which one, probably this. Um, they insert just another IC in there, a USB 2.0 hub, <laughs> to just uh, attach a audio interface uh, IC. So yeah, those adapters, adapters are quite large, but then you also get audio. But yeah, this isn't really interesting for our use case. And some of them even have a small 8 megabyte SPI flash IC where they store the uh, Windows driver. And it enumerates as a mass storage device as well, so you basically can attach it to any Windows machine and then you also have the driver on there. Uh, this is kind of annoying under Linux because you need to detach the kernel driver first or blacklist it for this device uh, because otherwise the connection might just uh, drop when somebody accesses the, uh, the SPI flash there. Um, some of the cheaper adapters don't have this uh, flash. Of course, it costs something, but you also just can desolder it and uh, populate, I think, this resistor here with uh, 10K, and then uh, flash is disabled and there's also no endpoint. Yeah. Uh, Did you try installing Osmo FLTK on the flash? Um, yeah, later maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it would be interesting to just uh, do a very small just Linux kernel uh, and just boot from it and stream out the HDD <laughs> content. But uh, yeah. So re reverse engineering this, um, yeah. I basically took the same approach uh, as, as when I wrote um, the initial version of RTL-SDR, just uh, use a virtual box VM 
with uh, Windows in there, um, the original driver installed, forward the USB device to, um, to the machine, and then sniff the USB traffic uh, with Wireshark on, on Linux. And um, then just yeah, try to replay those, um, those USB transfers and uh, see what happens. And then remove stuff until it doesn't work anymore. So you figure out, okay, what's really needed? And then play with the register contents and see what changes and, and what happens. So um, I then basically played with uh, the, uh, uh, figured out where the H-Sync and V-Sync stuff is set. And um, yeah, also figured out the, U the actual USB uh, or the, the format in the USB buffer, this is, which is kind of weird. Um, by just basically using the full screen picture in the VM with just one red pixel at the top left, for example, and then look at Wireshark and see, ah, okay, this, is, this must be the first pixel. And um, yeah, then actually try to understand how the, the uh, PLL is set up. It's a 32-bit re register and they are played with the with the values in there to, uh, to, to get to, to a structure. I just attach the um, um, oscilloscope and uh, see what frequencies output and then yeah, d deduct from that how to set the PLL. And after quite some experimentation, I basically ended up with this. Uh, yeah, this is just a 100 megahertz oscilloscope, so it's quite band limited. I was outputting a 150 megahertz signal here, but as you can see, there were still I got completely ri um, rid of uh, H-Sync and V-Sync, but there were still a couple of samples uh, lost. Um, at this point, I already played around and transmitted uh, DAB successfully. I mean, it's OFDM, so I think six samples were missing here, and this uh, uh, is easily fixed by the receiver. But, um, of course, if for example, when transmitting um, wideband FM or so, you, you had a, p uh, a crackle with a certain uh, period, of course. And um, it took me quite some time to, to figure out uh, what, was, what was going wrong. And I mean, at this point, it wasn't even clear if it's possible at all to um, output a continuous stream of samples. But um, yeah, I, I looked again at the Wireshark traces and I noticed, well, uh, the last ERP of the uh, USB transfer was actually smaller than all the other ERPs. And this was because I was using full HD <laughs> resolution. Um, so so the, the biggest buffer size the device can support. But actually, this isn't the multiple of the ERP size. So I, yeah, just... Yeah, this is basically just the small, yeah, smallest transfer unit of uh, the... Um, of a USB transfer on the bus. It's split into those herbs on the lowest layer. And um, yeah, then I used a resolution, in this, ca in this case uh, 1280 times uh, 124 times three colors is exactly um, the herb size times 64. So an even multiple. And this worked. Uh, the result is uh, basically a 150 megahertz on some Intel chips that's even up to 156 megahertz um, three channel 8-bit deck with USB interface so without any lost samples and uh, of course you can use this for, for lots of different applications and um, yeah so now we have uh, a library called libosmo fl2k which can initialize the device um, set the sample rate by configuring the PLL and you can feed it with 8-bit uh, signed or unsigned samples. It, uh, it does the conversion of the buffer format, and it even uses um, zero-copy buffers, uh, which are quite new, no, not that new anymore, but uh, they are in, in uh, libUSB for quite some time. And I think starting with the Linux kernel 4.6, it's supported by the Linux kernel, or 4.11 even. Um, yeah, and this uh, reduces the uh, CPU load quite a bit because um, yeah, you save all this copy to user, copy from user, copy from user in this case, with yeah, up to 450 megabytes per second, basically. And um, this library comes with a couple of applications, um, like similar to, to the structure in RTL-SDR. 
there's the FL2K file, which just streams a file with samples to the device uh, and uh, repeats. You can actually disable this via command line if you just want to output this file once. And then there's FL2K TCP, which uh, just yeah, takes TCP input and streams it to the device, for example. You can use a new radio TCP sync and then uh, use that to, to stream it to the device. And um, there's FL2K FM, which works in real time and even on um, not so powerful hardware. For example, I tested it on the Galaxy S5, which actually has USB OTG uh, support. Um, and yeah, it can be used together with uh, SOX to transmit wideband FM. Um, and the actual modulation code was uh, taken from the VGA SIG project, which I mentioned earlier uh, from, from 2009. And um, yeah, the, the FM modulation code is from basically by using DDS and then um, changing the modulation frequency. And uh, just uh, last week, I've uh, implemented the uh, yeah, RDS support, which is from another project called uh, Pi FM RDS, where they use this Raspberry Pi TX thing. And uh, so RDS is working there as well now. I also ported uh, RTL test, which is now called FL2K test, and which can be used to determine uh, the uh, clock inaccuracy, basically, of, of those dongles. They are not really worse than RTL SDR. It's like plus minus 20 ppm or something like that. And um, um, yeah. And what's still needed is uh, basically an efficient upsampler to to upsample from. Uh, baseband rate to yeah 150 megahertz or 130 megahertz in real time. Um, Hernchen started with it, but there's still some more work needed to make the filter better. <laughs> and um, if you have a powerful enough machine, it actually works with a uh, radio flow graph in, in real time. Um, I did that with uh, basically streaming it over TCP into RT uh, FL2K TCP. So this works as well. And um, yeah, I did quite some testing with, with different um, signals. Uh, and yeah, for example, yeah, Wideband FM is working with FL2K FM. DAB with samples generated by ODR DEP uh, mod. Uh, DVBT, GSM with samples from um, Osmo TRX, um, UMTS where I took samples uh, from OpenBATS, UMTS, and LTE, and <laughs> surprisingly, even GPS, um, which is then already the 11th harmonic of the main DAC signal. So it's really weak, but yeah, GPS receivers are quite uh, sensitive, and uh, yeah, it works nice with uh, GPS SDR SIM. And yeah, just as an example for for GSM transmission, yeah, you, I've upsampled the uh, samples with new radio, and uh, also just use a fractional resampler. And uh, my dongle, for example, the, the FL2K dongle has a PPM offset of 15 ppm, and just resample this as well, and then you have an accurate, accurate enough clock that uh, it can be seen by a mobile phone. And in this case, the the synthesized carrier frequency basically contained in the samples is 40.6 megahertz. And when using a DAC sample rate of uh, 138 megahertz, you basically get the, the, yeah, the, the first harmonic at 138 plus minus 40.6, third harmonic at 414, and so on. And the seventh harmonic then is at four, uh, um, 966 plus minus 40.6, where the lower image is at 900. 25.4, which is Afkin 976, so you can actually uh, receive it on your phone. So you don't even need um, to, uh, to attach a piece of wire or an, or an antenna, um, which yeah, creates all kinds of interference. But if you put it close enough to your receiver, it can be basically used to do on-desk testing. And uh, you, you see here, this is uh, the Osmocom monitor tool, yeah. I mean, it's really close to the device, but yeah, you get uh, minus 78 dBm, and even the uh, Android phone close by these, uh, the signal in the network search. And yeah. 
Yeah, further ideas. Um, I mean, of course, you could uh, do yeah, connect, for example, an IQ modulator to uh, the dongle. You have three decks, so yeah, two of them are enough to do IQ. Uh, do attach a, a low pass filter to do baseband filtering and um, then then transmit it, which is basically the approach that the uh, that the guys at Dust Labor were, were were taking with the normal VGA card, but they still had the issue of dropped samples. So yeah, this is um, this is better. Or just yeah, also add a reconstruction filter and use it as a lab signal generator. Um, and of course, uh, if you want to do simultaneous transmission, um, uh, just synchronize the the clock with RTLSDR somehow. Either use a common clock source. Um, the the FL two K dongle has a ten megahertz uh, oscillator. And uh, use it as a, as a very cheap transceiver. I mean, of course, there's still some buffering going on in the, in the library because at those high rates, um, if you do something on the desktop, otherwise the, the transfer will simply interrupt. And uh, so this is something that needs to be yeah, worked on to, to minimize the latency. Yeah. Um, one thing that could be done, for example, is um, use one of the uh, DAC channels to just output 28.8 megahertz. So you can actually use that as a clock source for RTL-STR. Then you would have a synchronized uh, transmitter and receiver. Yeah. Um, and there are quite some quality differences between uh, the exact models of those dollars because the FL the FL two thousand chip has two two inputs. One is the normal three point three volt digital supply, and then a one point two volt DAC reference voltage. And um, the best devices are actually those which use two LDOs for both uh, DAC reference and digital supply. So here you can see this is a screenshot of a spectrum analyzer. Um, of course, you have some phase noise on there, um, but otherwise it's, it's uh, kind of clean. But okay, I took a very bad example. If you use one with uh, two switching regulators, <laughs> you can see basically the uh, <coughs> the signal being modulated, but with the switching frequency of the regulator. I think in this case um, it was like 1.1 megahertz switching frequency, and you just can see here the harmonics. So yeah. Most of the cheap ones actually have switching regulators, but of course you just can solder in an LDO or yeah, try to get a device with uh, with LDOs. And um, yeah, this is basically the whole output spectrum uh, until 500 megahertz. So yeah, <laughs> I mean there's lots of harmonics, but uh, yeah, you actually can use that to to even receive something in the uh, in the GPS band or an L band. Yeah. I uh, think with, uh, with a uh, Pluto SDR, I've seen harmonics up to 1.8 something gigahertz. So it's, uh, yeah, really lots of harmonics. Yeah, which brings me to the end. You can find more information in the, in the wiki. Any questions? Oh. Uh, if you manage to uh, synchronize uh, uh, RTL SDR with your transmitter mm -hmm. um, in in frequency, did you think uh, how to synchronize them in in time? Yeah, um, this is of course something that's also also an issue. Um, you could um, I, yeah just transmit it, for example GSM, and yeah, then or use some noise. Yeah, some noise um, or um some yeah some pilot signal or what what I also thought about is yeah most of the RTL SDR dongles these days uh, use the the RI twenty T um, re receiver right and um, basically one of the ADCs is unused on the on the RTL SDR oh, which, which they are which they are using for um, uh, direct sampling input 
And as you have three decks here, which are also synchronized in time, you basically just could use one of them to directly feed to the ADC of the RTL SDR and then just output a, a pulse. Because you can switch between the, uh, mm. with, uh, with uh, RTL SDR um, set direct sampling mode or something like this, you can um, basically switch to the other um, ADC input on the RTL SDR. So you basically could use this to do some periodic or initial uh, synchronization. Uh, th this is interesting because I would think about transmitting, just transmitting something, do some software, digital uh, software processing, and then uh, I would get some uh, offset and adjust. Uh, I mean, yeah, but, uh, of, co of course. this way is uh, very interesting. Yeah. I mean, this would work as well, but yeah, if you want to do it basically without transmitting anything, then mm. this would also be an idea. Yeah. So there's there are yeah, lots of different approaches, but yeah. I have a question, um, especially um, concerning the uh, problem of synchronizing things. I mean, the SCH sync uh, and CV sync signal is still available. Um, couldn't that be used, or could it? Or is there some problem that prevents the use of that? I mean, that could be used to generate some sync clock or something. Uh, the FCCH or uh, the the H sync and the V sync, the outputs on the uh, on the VGA, the synchronization outputs, they are already there and they could be used to synchronize other circuits. Yeah, you, yeah, would also be possible. Yeah, but uh, actually in this case, there's nothing outputted anymore because it's completely okay. disabled. Is so you would uh, need to enable it again and then have. Yeah. It's prob is it or difficult or is it just uh, some flag in the uh, USB packets you sent? In order to enable it, you would need to basically increase the H-Sync interval again and then you have a gap between the samples which you then need to take into account in the synchronization as well. And I'm not entirely sure if you change those mm -hmm. parameters on the fly. So enabling the sync would bring us back to the problem where we have the lost samples, so then it's not exactly. an option. Yeah. Okay, so that's how much so hardware done. But actually, as you have three decks, you just can put into yeah, the yeah. buffer. Uh, you can just can output a rectangle sign, whatever, small pulse. Yeah, so you just do it, can do it by software. So, yeah. yeah. Thanks. All right. More questions? All right. Then, thanks for your attention. And uh, yeah, you can find the code uh, apparently <laughs> in the GitHub repository uh, um, or in, on, uh, on our Git server and more information in the wiki. Thank you. <laughs>